Building a channel is like being a parent to a certain extent. Creators want their channels to do well. They want to see their analytics grow. When first starting out, every small move forward is a big deal. There are many channels out there who can gain many times the subscribers that a small channel like this one has in total every single day. They get more views on a quick video made in just a couple hours on a whim than small channels like Roasted Opinions have over the lifetime of the channel. They didn't start out there though, and even the mighty PewDiePie still works to build more audience and make better content. That's the nature of creative businesses like this one. Grow, evolve, improve, or die. Naturally, anything that interferes with growth is a big deal to content creators. For monetized channels, that interference hits them right in the wallet. For smaller channels still struggling to reach the fabled land where YouTube shares advertising money with them, interference often results in them just giving up. Most YouTube hopefuls quit making new content before they reach monetization, and even after the survivors reach that coveted monetized status on their channel, running that channel doesn't get any easier. Rather the opposite in fact, what with devoting enough time to make ad-worthy video content for the rather small amounts that a creator receives as a monetized small channel. But when YouTube throws up more roadblocks to success, well, it's time for some discussion. For me, that means more roasted opinions, and this time, I'll have to slow roast them. YouTube is a sensational platform. No, really. I've watched videos by all sorts of people sharing all sorts of information. A viewer can find almost any kind of content on YouTube so long as it's the sort of content that kids should be able to watch. More on that later, okay? It's because YouTube is such a great platform that I get so incredibly irritated with the company when I find them messing with channels, especially when I see it happening on my little channel. Roasted Opinions posted its first episode on June 3, 2018. This channel is less than a year old. Since then, I've published over 60 videos. The purpose of my channel was to give people a place to come together and discuss all sides of the issues which I raise in my videos. The channel has grown, albeit not as some sort of overnight sensation. I started with just two subscribers, and in less than a year, I've welcomed a hundred more. Based on the research I've done to try to understand how to make a better channel and increase my growth rates, I've learned that I'm really not doing that badly. Among all YouTube channels, Roasted Opinions is approaching the top 10 million or so in total views and subscribers. That means that I'm in the upper half. Not bad for a channel created by an average guy with a laptop and a microphone in his living room. If I just keep on making good content every week, sharing that content to let people know that I've got something new to watch, and I keep my spirits up, I'll reach my goals. Right? If YouTube lets me, that is. I was checking last Sunday on the performance of my latest video, A Broad Field. I didn't exactly expect a huge response for it, since it was a quick rundown of the current candidates for President of the United States and my opinions about their economic policies. I was disappointed to see that my dashboard showed exactly Two views. Oh well, not every video is a hit. I popped over to my video list because that's where I find out how many likes the videos get. To my surprise, I saw that the video list showed I had four views and three likes on the same video. What? How could I have more likes on the video list than views showing in my dashboard? I went to live analytics for the video and it confirmed the dashboard numbers. Two views. Somehow, at least two views have been removed from my count, including one which liked the video. What on earth is going on? Well, the like counter on YouTube is not tied directly to the view counter, and the view counter has got some really interesting features to it now. Before I go further, let me share with you some quick categories which I use to sort out channels by size. The names I'm about to give are my own. It doesn't really matter what names are used, however. I've seen roughly the same categories referred to using animal names. I'm giving the names which I use for these categories solely for clarity. The smallest category is what I call startups, channels with less than 10 subscribers. Startups usually don't have many videos or a set publishing schedule of any kind. They're effectively private channels where people can and do share short videos that they've made with their friends and family, and most of them have no aspirations to be more than that. 
There are tens of millions of these channels currently, and more to come, I'm sure. Next come the casual hobbyists, channels with between 10 and 99 subscribers. These channels are moving out of the pack with creators who are intentionally making content for public consumption and who are interested to see just how many people will tune in. There are at least 11 million channels this size. Next comes the serious hobbyists, like me, channels with between 100 and 999 subscribers. These channels are not yet big enough for monetization, but they are big enough that YouTube is starting to look at them. Unfortunately, this is where some creators will make use of bots, programs designed to inflate view and like counts in order to reach monetized status. This is also where content bots will start scanning videos to see if there are any copyrighted materials used which could be claimed. I've had a couple of claims filed against my content for using clips which bots flagged as theirs including Warner Media repeatedly claiming my videos which contain a music clip of God Save the Queen. I downloaded that clip from a website which only features open source material, and it should not be claimable. And yet, twice it's happened. I've also had a claim by The Daily Show for video content that I used their material when I posted my own capture of the televised State of the Union address. I will certainly be very careful about using clips that I've video captured again even though I was careful to stay within the limits of fair use, and I recorded the clips from the Fox News feed. There are about 8 million channels in this category like mine, and most of them are facing the same problems. Next category up is the small channels, subscriber counts of at least 1,000, but not yet 10,000. These channels have hit monetization levels. They've also realized that AdSense and Super Chats won't pay the bills for them at this size. This is sort of an in-between level, when serious creators learn how to better market and earn revenue from their channels, often using different revenue streams, and less serious creators get frustrated with the paltry sums paid out by YouTube and quit. About 2.5 million channels currently fall in this category. Next up from small channels, strangely enough, is the medium channels. At least 10,000, but not yet 100,000 subscribers. There are some really good independent creators in this category. They still don't receive much support from YouTube, but they do receive some decent side income from their videos, which is why demonetization hits them much harder. There are around 420,000 such channels. Next come the large channels, at least 100,000, but not yet a million subscribers. There's a silver play button for these channels, as well as additional support from YouTube in the form of a partner manager assigned to the channel. When channels this size talk about contacting YouTube, they are talking about contacting their manager more often than not to discuss any problems that arise. Naturally, this provides a better level of support to the channel, and well it should. These channels provide a significant number of placements for ads on videos with high view counts. These are also channels that have been built up from nothing, often over a period of years. There are about 72,000 channels this size, each assigned to a manager which helps them with their further growth, effectively making such channels into perpetually growing revenue streams so long as they keep posting content and don't break the rules too badly or too often. This is the level at which many creators transition to full-time creation because they can make a decent middle-class living doing it. Next comes the YouTube stars, at least a million but not yet 10 million subscribers. These channels are cash cows for advertising, and thus they get a gold button and VIP treatment. And well, they should. These creators can make a very good living from their content. YouTube makes sure that the creators of these channels are very happy people, organizing events and helping them further cash in on their fame. That's incredibly useful for the creators because often at this level, they are having to bring on a sizable staff in their production company in order to keep making great content. As of now, there are around 8,000 channels this size. Finally, at least until either PewDiePie or T-Series manages to break the 100 million subscriber limit, there are the superstars, the biggest channels on YouTube, 10 million viewers or more. Around 200 channels have reached this rarefied air. YouTube takes care of these creators, helping them to deal with any issues which affect their channels. Each of these channels creates mountains of ad revenue and anything which threatens that ad revenue is a big deal for YouTube and the creator alike. These channels are also the inspiration for many new creators because people like Felix Shelberg earn millions of dollars annually for their work, and who doesn't want that? Now let's look back at three categories in particular. The serious hobbyists, 
small channels, and medium channels. Please bear in mind that what I'm about to say is all conjecture based on my own observations and anecdotal evidence gathered from other content creators. YouTube doesn't want creators to use bots to create monetization because bots don't buy product. No matter how many ads a bot looks at, it still won't purchase a single thing. And the companies who advertise on YouTube buy ad placements because they expect to boost their sales by more than they spend on their advertising. That's a basic marketing principle. And considering the amount of content that's uploaded every day, YouTube simply doesn't have the personnel to manually review everything. So, YouTube uses algorithms which sort out quality views from all the views. This helps to prevent the use of bots to boost views and subs, so that YouTube doesn't monetize content without an organic audience. For a small channel like mine, this means that every time a video gets too many clicks too fast, YouTube will pounce to remove all of them which don't last more than a few seconds. A few seconds isn't enough view time for them to run an ad, after all. This has on occasion cost me two-thirds of my initial views which I received. These views were too short and never survived the algorithm. It feels like throttling, especially when I expected YouTube to see that I've reached the serious hobbyist level on my own accord without bots, and might have something worth recommending to others, so that more audience can find my channel and decide if they wish to subscribe. The recommendations are limited by the size of the channel, as recommendations are based on which videos are getting the most traffic and small channel videos usually are not. Now, small channels also have to deal with a whole new sort of throttling. YouTube doesn't want their ads running on channels which cannot generate sufficient views every time, so they've imposed a new limit. No monetization unless your channel also has 10,000 views and 4,000 hours of watched content in the last year. This eliminates another method of manipulating the system, buying subscribers. Purchased subs don't buy products any more than ViewBots purchase products. This has caused much discontent from those who have reached the subscriber mark but still cannot monetize yet, because they haven't got the view count or time watched that they need for monetization. It feels like there's no help for creators who have spent months or even years building up their channel to this level. The recommendations are still limited too, and that doesn't help these channels to meet the view and watch time categories that they need. When they do monetize a channel, YouTube doesn't pay out until a channel earns $100 in revenue either. If a channel is monetized and only making 10 or 20 bucks a month, this means that checks will be very slow to come. And keep in mind that creators at this level are typically doing semi-professional to professional level work with professional or semi-professional level equipment in order to squeeze out these meager leavings which won't even pay for their investment. For those who survive these obstructions and grow past these levels, the medium channels face another level of throttling. Having proven that they can attract both subscriptions and quality views, medium channels now have to deal with subscription scrubbing and limited status. Now, subscription scrubbing is a process whereby YouTube decides, just like with views, which subscribers are quality subscribers. If a channel's subscribers aren't tuning in for every video, YouTube's algorithms will stop recommending that channel to the subscriber. If the subscriber doesn't notice that YouTube is not notifying them about that channel, then YouTube will eventually remove the subscription. For channels which are struggling, that can prove to be a massive discouragement. I've seen subscribers disappear before from channels to which I've subscribed. I've even had to resubscribe myself to a few channels which I didn't know were still making content despite activating the notification bell for that channel. Remember when I mentioned kid-friendly content, right? Kid-friendly is an accurate description only if one considers advertisers to be kids. It's advertisers who decide what's acceptable content ostensibly to protect the kids, but in reality to protect their brand and their sales. YouTube doesn't want to offend their advertisers, because that's where their money comes from, so they place videos which might have questionable content in limited status or even label it unsuitable for advertising. Limited status videos don't run ads very often because advertisers have to notify YouTube that they're fine with ads running on limited status videos. Videos marked unsuitable for advertising will receive no ads at all. Again, YouTube has to have algorithms handling this because there are too many videos uploaded every minute to check them all manually. That would be a problem if the videos were flagged once by the algorithms and then manually cleared and good to go. Unfortunately, 
the algorithms have a habit of flagging videos for limited or non-monetized status repeatedly even when they have already been manually cleared. That virtually guarantees that no ads will run in the critical first 48 hours. No money will be earned from that video, and channels which push the boundaries of what's acceptable content to YouTube will earn next to nothing. They will also be moved down the recommended list because YouTube recommends videos which can run ads before they recommend videos which can't. A content creator with 30,000 subs, which runs a video with limited status, will find their video recommended like their channel had 3,000 subscribers. The same creator posting a video that's unsuitable for advertising will see recommendations more like they were a 300 sub level serious hobbyist. What's more, everyone uses shortcuts, and even the YouTube algorithms are no different. If a channel uploads too many videos in a row which are placed in limited status, then the channel will see every single video automatically flagged for limited status regardless as to the content of that video. The channel itself seems to be flagged by the algorithms, and YouTube seems less likely to reverse flags on these videos than on an occasionally incorrectly flagged video from a channel that is not having problems. I'm certain that if this is true of limited status, then it's also true of unsuitable status. It would only make sense that the algorithms would also use other data that they've gathered, like the number of times that a channel has videos claimed for copyright violations or flagged as offensive by viewers. That means, of course, that just like view bots and subscription bots can skew the system in favor of a channel, claim bots and brigading attacks by people who are offended by different points of view can destroy a channel in no time at all. Remember, too, that those partner managers don't get assigned until a channel reaches that silver play button status, either. There's no real incentive for YouTube to restructure the system to take care of serious hobbyists, small channels, or medium channels, and a powerful incentive not to change how things work on YouTube. Money. Now, I can't prove anything which I've just said. As I told you before, this is conjecture based on observation and anecdotal evidence which I've gathered. But if you are on Twitter, Ask the Britisher, Shannon Gibbs, or Peach Bailey about the effects that the algorithms have on subscriber counts and views. Ask any number of independent creators about these problems, really, for you can find throttled channels in every genre. The real problem is not that YouTube wants to make sure that its content is suitable for advertising. That's understandable. It's that YouTube is listening to the wrong people to decide what content needs to be filtered out. YouTube is social media, and research shows that the most active voices on social media tend to cluster at the extreme ends of the spectrum, both politically and socially. Moreover, the voices on the left outnumber the voices on the right by 2 to 1, exaggerating the actual split in distribution on the political and social spectrum for viewers and ignoring the middle-of-the-road consumers. Content is deemed problematic by the loud voices on the extreme ends, and they report content in groups. This flags down channels whose only offense is holding the wrong opinions or showing support for another channel who is running into trouble from the fringe lunatics. The second group of people to whom YouTube is listening is major media companies. YouTube has signed partnership deals with those companies to increase their profitability. The media companies are placing video content on YouTube and linking it to their websites. In other words, tons of professionally produced content that's already on hand for these media companies is posted many times a day to channels which have an instant following brought over from the legacy media. Those major media companies are competing with the largest independent content creators for views, and it's been ugly for a long time. Do you remember those claim bots I mentioned? Well, the major media outlets have them, and they are claiming everything that they can from other channels. Warner Media owns CNN and its associated channels, for example, and CNN is on YouTube. Warner Media also owns an extensive catalog of music, television, and motion picture rights, and they have been filing claims left and right. Name a channel which uses video or music clips, and I'll bet you that you will find at least one copyright claim on their content which they've had to fight under fair use. Ask Steven Crowder about this. He's a YouTube gold button VIP, and he's currently fighting to keep his channel alive due to a triple hard strike filed against him. Even with the VIP assistance offered him by YouTube, Crowder may still lose his channel and has announced that he will have to fight the strikes in court. 
Louder with Crowder is a 3.7 million subscriber channel. It gains more than 2,000 new subscribers daily and is in the top 2,000 channels by size. His videos have about 800 million views in total. He's not as big as CNN, of course, but the daily view counts of CNN and Louder with Crowder are roughly comparable. In other words, Crowder is direct competition for CNN. Interestingly enough, the three hard copyright strikes which were issued to Louder with Crowder were filed by Warner Media Group on a parody video. Now this could certainly just be a coincidence, but it seems that Steven Crowder is facing an attempt to shut down his channel by Warner Media Group, his direct competitor. That raises another question which I have to ask, though. Since copyright claims can result in control of videos being transferred to the claimant during the critical first 48 hours, why are the claimants able to monetize that content for themselves based on the size of their channel, even if the content was already determined to be unavailable for monetization to the creator? Imagine the shock that an independent creator feels when their video, which was placed in limited status on their channel and not earning them anything, is claimed fully monetized by another channel, running ads and making money for the claimant when the original creator could not earn a single penny on the video from AdSense. It's yet another reason that YouTube is full of highly discouraged independent creators. YouTube needs to remember that independent creators are the heart and soul of their business model. We are the ones who drive new, diverse content, not the major media companies who, who keep on reporting the same news that other channels in major media are reporting, and not major media companies who are remaking classic movies instead of coming up with new scripts. We are the biggest reason why Google saw quarter after quarter of 20% or better growth in avid revenues, and allowing major companies to squelch us is why YouTube may have seen a significant slowdown in their ad revenue growth in the first quarter of 2019. Oh yeah, you might have heard about that. When Alphabet reported their earnings to Wall Street on April 30th, the slip in ad revenue growth which they had to report provoked a huge sell-off of Alphabet stock. The value of that stock dropped 7.7% in a single day. Alphabet lost billions of dollars of market capitalization because of it. Now some analysts will tell you quite sincerely that it's just a loss of faith in online advertising by the traditional brick and mortar advertisers, and it's likely to pass. But why would Alphabet allow the advantage of independent creators discovering uncharted territory in online content slip away from them? Steven Crowder may have a huge channel, but he's still an independent creator. This lawsuit could wind up becoming a landmark case in which independent creators will finally reverse the trend of constantly shifting expectations from YouTube and interference by major media companies. Do the agreements between major media companies and YouTube constitute a violation of antitrust law through the restriction of market access to their competitors which is going on? Does YouTube have the obligation, or even the right, to determine if content is covered under fair use laws, or should a judge be making those calls? If YouTube cannot make this determination, then who should? It's your choice, YouTube. Your company was based on innovative models. We're going to keep fighting for our channels, though.